If you have spent time around kids at all, any amount of time around kids, you quickly realize that they are very adept at picking up expressions and words and phrases and way of doing things from those around them. They are very quick to mimic what they see. In fact, if you think about it, this is how we teach kids to talk. We say a word and then we say, can you say that word? We want them to pair it back to emulate what we're doing. And while it's easy to see that in the lives of our kids, as adults, we do it as well. I'm sure if each of us took some time to think about it, we could think of women in our lives where we're like, oh, that's how they fold their laundry? That's so smart. I'm going to start doing it like that. Or, oh, that person does like, such a good job of putting an outfit together. Or I really like the way that they phrase things. And so I'm going to start doing it like that. We all are in the habit of mimicking, of emulating what we see. Well, as we finish out our study in the epistles of John, we see that John is very concerned about how Gaius is going to emulate those around them, around him. And he wants to make sure that Gaius is choosing wisely who he imitates. So as we turn to 3 John, the final few verses, we're going to start at verse 11, where John writes this. Beloved, do not imitate evil, but imitate good. Whoever does good is from God, but whoever does evil has not seen God. Demetrius has received a good testimony from everyone and from the truth itself. We also add our testimony, and you know that our testimony is true. And then he closes the letter by saying, I had much to write to you. There was so much more I wanted to say, but I would rather not write with pen and ink. I hope to see you soon, and we will talk face to face. Peace be to you. The friends greet you. Greet the friends, each by name. The very first thing that we see as we look at this passage, it's the very first imperative in 3 John. The very first time John is giving a command to Gaius, it's that he wants Gaius to make sure that he is imitating what is good. Or as I put it, we all need to make sure, point one, that we follow those who follow Christ. We need to follow those who follow Christ because John is concerned about the pattern of Gaius's life. As Gaius makes decisions about who he is going to try to emulate, who he is going to try to be like, John wants to make sure that he is choosing those who are acting in such a way that God is honored through them. Now, there are many reasons that we may choose to emulate someone. We may say, oh, that person, the way they do their hair, I, I really like it. I'm going to be just like her. Or, you know, that person, she's so friendly everywhere she goes. She's never met a stranger. I wish I could be more like her. Or, uh, that mom, that, their, her kids must be never bored because she is always coming up with the most creative, the most fun ways to spend their time at home. And all of those may seem like, oh, those are good reasons to imitate someone. But the only reason that really matters, the only criteria that we really should have is how faithfully does that person follow Christ? How faithfully does that person do what God has called them to do? Is that woman in God's word daily? Is she meditating on it day and night? Is she serving in the church? Is she loving others? Is she giving sacrificially? Is she praying faithfully? Is she saying only what is good for building others up? And is she as much as possible living at peace with everyone? These are what God commands us to do. And as we look and see, well, who is it that we want to be like? We should be using the same criteria to decide who we are going to imitate. There's only one criteria that really matters. Does that person live as Jesus did? You see, as you may recall, John is very concerned about the impact that Diotrephes would have on Gaius and the church. As you may remember, Diotrephes was rebelling against the rightful authority of John and the other apostles. 
And John wants to make sure as Gaius looks out and he sees, oh, you know, Geotrophes, he has a lot of influence. A lot of people look up to him. John wants to say, hey, time out. Someone who is rebelling against the authority that God has pointed, that is not someone that you should be imitating. That is not someone that you should be striving to be like. Instead, Gaius, you need to imitate what is good. And that's what we need to do as well. We need to look for those people whose pattern of life is such that we can say their pattern of life is an active and fervent pursuit of Christ. As we're considering who we want to imitate, we should ask ourselves, if I follow this person, if I do what this person does, will my life be more like Christ or less? And if the answer is less, if we can't look at this person's life and say, well, if I do what they do, I'm going to actually be farther away from what God has called me to do, then it doesn't matter how many other wonderful things about them there are. It doesn't matter how well they prepare their meals. It doesn't matter how good they are at social media or how beautifully they dress. They are not someone that we should be striving to be like. And John tells us why it's so important that we imitate what is good. Verse 11, he says, imitate good, and then he tells us why. Because whoever does good is from God, but whoever does evil has not seen God. Whoever does evil is not in a close relationship with God. In other words, those who do good, those who pattern their lives after those who follow Christ, they are walking in step. They are close to Jesus. But whoever does evil, that person is far from Jesus. And so we need to make sure that we recognize that the pattern of our lives, who we choose to imitate, and how we conduct our lives is indicative of our relationship with Christ. And we see, I recognize that as we think about this, you might be like, okay, Natalie, I get that. I need to pattern my life after someone who follows Christ. But you know what? I don't know anyone who does that perfectly. You're right. No one does that perfectly. You're not, you're not perfect, and you're not going to find someone perfect to follow. But again, what we're looking at is, is their pattern of life such? Are they in consistent and regular pursuit of God and his word? And do they apply it to their lives? Are they faithful to do what God has called them? And this is a pattern we see throughout scripture. In Philippians 3.17, Paul writes, Join in imitating me and walk according to the example you have in us. Look at those people who are patterning their lives after God's word and walk according to the way that they do. Hebrews 3.17 says, Remember your leaders. Consider the outcome of their life. Consider how they apply God's word to their life and the result of that. And then imitate their faith. And perhaps the most famous passage is 1 Corinthians 11.1, where Paul writes, Be imitators of me as I imitate Christ. We need to make sure that as we look at who we want to be like, who we want to emulate, we can say, that person is committed to following Christ. And because that person is committed to following Christ, that sister is an active and diligent pursuit of Jesus. I'm going to strive to be more like her. I'm going to strive to imitate Jesus as I see her following him. The more that we obey God, the closer to God we will be. As it says in this passage, whoever does good is from God, and whoever does evil, conversely, has not seen God. So those who do good have seen God. They are close to him. The more we pattern our lives after the truth of Scripture, the more we are going to be closer to God. And if we want to obey God more, we need to faithfully follow those whose life conforms to his word. The next thing that we see in our passage is that John commends this man named Demetrius. Look with me in verse 12 where he says this. He says, Demetrius has received a good testimony from everyone and from the truth itself. We also add our testimony, and you know that our testimony is true. As we've learned throughout our study, Demetrius was likely the carrier of the letters. He was the mailman of the first century, right? He was bringing the letters from John to the church. 
Now, if you think about it, someone knocks on your door and says, hey, I have some letters from the Apostle John. It pro- it's not going to happen to your door, but just imagine with me, right? Hey, I have some letters from the Apostle John. You want to know something about the person bringing these letters because you want to make sure that they're legitimate, that these are really letters from the Apostle John, that you can trust the person who is bringing this message. And so John gives an affirmation. He gives a commendation of Demetrius. And he says three things about Demetrius, three things that verify that this is a reliable person. He says that they're that Demetrius has a good testimony from everyone. Everyone. You meet some random person at church, and you say, hey, tell me about this guy, Demetrius. And they're like, he's a good guy. This is a reliable, dependable, faithful person. It says that Demetrius has a good testimony from the truth itself. John is saying, look, Demetrius' life conforms to Scripture. Demetrius' life, his conduct, is what God's word says it should be. Because the truth itself, the very word of God, when you look at it and you look at Demetrius' life, there is alignment. And then the third thing he says is we also, John and the church leaders, we also add our testimony. And you know that our testimony is true. It didn't matter who you asked. It didn't matter what circumstance you were talking about. It didn't matter what obstacles or what challenges there were in Demetrius' life. Everywhere to everyone, he had a good reputation as someone who was faithfully doing what God had called them to do. And the same should be true of us. We need to point to always do what honors God. Always do what honors God. And I want us to recognize there's, there's reason it says always do. Because you think about Demetrius' life, no one knew what was inside his heart, right? We can trust by the pattern of his life that he loved God because his life conformed to the truth. But that's not what people could observe. That's not what people could base his reputation on. They could only base his reputation on his actions, on what they could visibly see, as, it, as Jesus said in Matthew 5, 16, he said, let your light shine before men. Let your light shine before men. Let everyone see the kind of light that you are living so that they may see your good works, so that they can pay attention to the pattern of your life, how you conduct yourself, the way that you behave when someone is mean to you, the way that you respond with kindness instead of aggravation to your children so that they may see your good works and they may give glory to your Father in heaven. Ladies, this is an amazing thing. Other people can look at our lives and because of how faithful we are to do what honors God, God gets praise. They praise God because of our lives. That is an amazing thing. That is an amazing thing, but it happens when we are committed, when we wake up each and every day and we say, today, just like Demetrius, no matter what circumstances I face, no matter what challenges may come my way, no matter the people I encounter, I am going to do what God has called me to do. Many of you probably know Pastor Wes, and for those of you who don't, Pastor West was a pastor here at Compass who unexpectedly passed away at 34 years old. It was very sudden. And he passed away a few years ago. But before he became Pastor West, Pastor West was just West, my dear friend. We had known each other for over a decade, and he was like the little brother I never had. And I was privileged because of the closeness of our friendship that when he passed away, I had the opportunity to speak at his memorial service. And it was me and two other of his friends who talked about the, his entirety of his life. And we talked about what we knew about Wes and what, he, what we saw in his life. And we didn't talk to each other beforehand. We didn't compare notes. We didn't make sure, like, okay, you get this section of his life. We'll get, you get this section. We just shared from our hearts based of our friendship with him. And what was amazing is that after it was all over, one of the other people who shared said, 
you know what's kind of amazing? All three of us said the exact same thing about Wes. We knew Wes from different contexts. We all knew him before he became a pastor, so this wasn't us just like, well, you have to say nice things about the pastor, right? This was us just sharing from our hearts what we had observed in Wes. And although we compared no notes, we all said the same thing. Wes was committed to honoring God, Wes loved his family, and Wes was faithful to serve the church because that was the pattern of his life. He was committed to doing what honored God, regardless of the circumstance, regardless of the challenges. He lived his life to please Jesus. And so when God called his home, that was the only thing that we could say about him because that was the encapsulation of his life. It is a wonderful thing if people give that kind of testimony about us when Jesus calls us home. But that only happens based on how we live today. When Jesus calls us home, it is too late to form that reputation. Our reputation is formed based on the daily choices that we make. By rising every morning and says, Jesus, by your grace, help me to do the things that will please you. Help me to honor you. Help me to have kind words on my lips. Help me to see the person that is hurting and to reach out. Help me to do what please you each and every moment of the day. Are we going to be perfect? No, we're not going to be perfect. But we can all get a little bit better so that when someone looks at our lives, that they can say, that person is committed to honoring God. And it might be helpful to apply the same diagnostic to our lives that John used to talk about Demetrius. Again, in verse 12, he talks about three aspects, three ways that we know Demetrius had a good reputation. The first is everyone. Everyone spoke well about him. And it's good for us to think, what, does the peop- what do the people in our community, what would they say about us based on how I've interacted with them this week? What would our neighbors say? What would our kids' teachers say? What would the person who bags our groceries say? Are we shining our light before men in such a way that they can say, even if they do not follow Jesus, you know what, that person, that person desires to honor God. The second part of Demetrius' testimony is the truth itself. Demetrius had a good testimony from the truth itself because his life conformed to Scripture. And it's worthwhile to ask ourselves, how about my life? Does my life conform with scripture? Am I doing the things that God has called me to do? Am I letting no corrupting talk come out of my mouth, but only what is good for building others up? Am I making sure that I'm keeping my conduct pure and honorable in front of others? When I look at scripture and I look at my life, Is there a general pattern of alignment? And where am I lacking? Where is there a disconnect between what Scripture says and how I'm living? And then how can I get in line with Scripture? And then the third criteria that John used is he said, we also add our testimony. John and the church leaders said, Demetrius, he is a reliable guy. What about our church leaders? What would our pastor say about our lives? What would your ministry leader say? What about your small group leader? If your small group leader was going to give a testimony based on the conduct in the group, would, you, would they say, you know what, that woman, she is committed to honoring God. She strives to do what pleases Jesus. And remember, the goal in this is not to honor ourselves. We're not trying to honor God so that we get a lot of praise, so that people say, wow, that person is really, really faithful. 
We want to turn any of that praise right back to our Heavenly Father. We want to make sure that He gets the glory. But we need to commit to consistently obeying God, regardless of our circumstances, of treasuring Him over any other relationship, of honoring Him in every aspect of our lives. John next turns to the closing of the letter. He's wrapping up things here. And he says this in verse 13. He said, I had much to write to you, but I would rather not write with pen and ink. I hope to see you soon, and we will talk face to face. Peace be to you. The friends greet you. Greet the friends, every one of them. What John is doing here as he wraps us this, up this letter to Gaius, he is communicating his personal investment in Gaius and the need for Gaius to be personally invested in the people of the church. And we need to make sure that we do the same, or as I put it in point three, we need to get face-to-face -face with Christian friends. We need to get face-to-face -face with Christian friends. If you look at what John's right here, he is not content with kind of a theoretical or a cursory affection for Gaius to have for the church. He's not saying like, hey, Gaius, make sure those people over there know you love them. No, he's saying, Gaius, you need to go and you need to greet the friends. You need to go and you need to make sure that every one of them knows who you are and that you have extended God's blessings their, his blessings of peace in their, in their lives. And he's saying, look, I'm personally invested in you. I want to get face to face with you. I want to talk to you soon. This pen and ink, it's great, but it is not sufficient for the type of investment that I want to have in your life. There is no substitute for being face to face. Or as one of my friends like to say, there is great blessing in the present of being present. The present of being present. Now, I realize we've come through a very unusual time in our global history where we have not been able to get face-to-face. -face. And we've gotten the opportunity to use things like Zoom. We've relied on maybe text and Facebook messages. And we've had the opportunity to maintain connections even though we haven't been sitting face-to-face. -face. But please... Let us recognize those things are wonderful tools. And I sincerely mean this. I thank God that we live in a day and age where we have them, where we can maintain those connections when we couldn't be together. But let's not think that those are substitutes for the present of being present. Because there is something wonderful that happens when we are face-to-face when we can greet people by name, when we know and are known by our Christian sisters. Now, as I say that, I fear that there may be two possible responses. The first response, you might be like, um, Natalie, I'm here. So obviously I get, we need to be present. Thank you for being here. I appreciate it. It would be a very lonely teaching if I was talking to an empty room. So I get it. It probably seems like I'm teaching to the choir. But I hope we all understand just showing up is not the same as being personally invested in our sisters in Christ. In John 15, when John writes more about friendship and specifically Jesus calling the disciples friends. Jesus says this. He says that we are to love one another. John 15, 12. Love one another as I have loved you. When you show up to Bible study, are you loving the sisters in your group like Jesus loved you? And then he, wrote, he says in verse 13, greater love has no one than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. Have we built Christian friendships like that? Have we built the kind of relationships where we can say, I am willing to do whatever it takes in order to spur you on to love and good deeds? 
I am willing to sacrifice my time. I am willing to sacrifice my money. I am willing to sacrifice my energy for you, my sister in Christ, because I want to love you as Jesus loved me. Building that kind of friendship doesn't happen just by showing up. It doesn't happen just by sitting next to someone. It happens as a result of a purposeful, personal investment in, someone light, in someone's life. We want to make sure that we have built friendships who will hold us accountable, who will tell us when the things that we are doing are not honoring to God, and we want to build friendships where people will encourage us, where they will cheer us on in our race to be more like Jesus. It's not enough to just be busy doing things with our friends, our Christian friends. We want to be busy doing the things of God, talking about the things of God, and cheering one another on to a more faithful walk with Christ. So that might be your first response. Like, I'm here, check, being here, not just enough. Please make sure that you're invested in the lives of your sisters. The second response that I fear there might be is you may be like, well, I would love to get face-to-face -face with Christian friends. But you know what, Natalie? No one has asked me. To that I say, ask them. Ask them. Luke 6, 31 says, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. It's the golden rule. We probably all know it. But if no one has asked you and you recognize that there is a deficiency in your life of sisters who can hold you accountable and can spur you on, then you get busy doing the work of building those friendships. I mean, think about what John told Gaius. He said, you go and greet the friends. You make the effort. Be proactive. Now think about it. Diotrephes, this man of great influence and great significance, was opposed to Gaius' allegiance to John and the church, the church leaders. So when Gaius is going out and greeting these people, he was probably going to get some snarky responses. It wasn't like everyone was like, hey, Gaius, how's it going? Right? They knew that there was some tension there. And John says, you know what, Gaius? You still go. You still make the effort. You need to be vulnerable and risk getting hurt because the relationships that we have with our family and God, they matter. And Bethany was so great a few weeks ago, you might remember, Bethany gave us a ton of very practical suggestions of how we can do this, how we can start the practice of building Christian friendships. And so if you're like, no one has asked me, please, Make the first step. Ask them. Ask that person, that maybe even that person that you look up to, that you say, that is someone who I can pattern my life after. Say, can we grab coffee? Can we take, talk a walk, take a walk and talk about our Bible study? And I get it. It's hard. Much to everyone's surprise, I am an introvert by nature. And I get it. Like, what I want to do is I want to go and I want to cuddle up with a good book on my couch. But that is not a luxury that the Bible has given me. Because the Bible tells us you need to be invested in the lives of your sisters. You need to be willing to be poured out for their sake. And so we need to be proactive. We need to take the steps of reaching out to those around us in our church family to build relationships, to personally invest in the lives of our sisters. Over the past year, as we've been studying these letters of John, we've talked a lot about what it means to love. The, the title of our series, Truth and Love. And we've talked a lot about loving God and loving others. And loving God, as we've repeatedly said, means doing what he says that we should do. 
How do we want to know that we love God? We do what he says. And loving others requires us laying down our lives for their sake. And if we want to do this well, if we want to love God and love others well, we are going to emulate those people who we see doing good. We're going to emulate, imitate those people that are loving God and loving others. We're going to commit to daily, consistently, regardless of the circumstance, honoring God. And we're going to invest in personal relationships with our sisters in Christ. We are going to get face to face with them because we care about them and because we want both of our lives to be more conformed to Scripture. If we do these things, and like Demetrius, we also will have a good testimony. We will have a life that is worthy of commendation, not just from those around us, but most importantly, from our Father who is in heaven. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this opportunity that we've had over this past year in the midst of strange circumstances in our world to learn more about it, what it means to love you and to love the people that you've placed in our lives. Father, I ask that this would not just be an academic or a theoretical study, but as we close out studying these letters of John, that we would be diligent to apply the truths that we have learned to our lives, that you would bring to mind the things that we've studied, the lessons that we've learned, and that we would be faithful and diligent to increasingly walk in keeping with your word. And Father, I thank you, as Stacy said, Lord, I thank you for all the people who have made this study possible, for the tech team, for the music team, for Kids Club, for the MCs, for our Bible study leaders, for Stephanie and her team who's put it together, for the teachers. Father, we know that we are probably unaware of all the work that has gone in. But we are grateful for those people who have been faithful to do what you have called them to do. And as a result, we have been blessed. I ask, Father, that as each of these ladies go to their small group, that you would allow it to be a rich and fruitful discussion. That it may be the time, even now, of planting the seeds for strong Christian friendships where we can spur each other on and we can come alongside each other to walk closer to you, to honor you more in our lives. Thank you, Father, for this time that we have set aside to talk about your word. What a blessing it is. In Jesus' name, amen.